20, 30 yards away was this thing peeking over this pine bush. It was a large, hairy animal, uh, dark brown, black hair. All of a sudden, this creature let out a, I want to call it a blood curdling, growling, howling scream. That's when I realized it wasn't my friend that had snuck up on me. <gasps> Dude, all the branches that are broken off are red. That's crazy. There's no medulla. Oh, hey. Glenn Norbert. Yep. Oh, I'm going to meet you the first time ever. Wow. <laughs> nice. I'm so glad you're here. Talk like to us. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Um, I got you a little well, thank you for coming. This is huge. So Absolutely. we brought this here, and we've set this up as best we can. Okay. And talk. Okay. So this I found in mm -hmm. just outside of Florence, Colorado, mm -hmm. uh, down on the Arkansas River. And I thought it was something weird, but there's water, there's water. People walk down there all the time. Not all the time. People walk down there. Sure. And I've seen footprints there in the area. Mm -hmm. This was in some deep grass, uh, but it caught my attention. The heel caught my attention because it looked like a boot print. Right. And that's what really made me go, this might be something weird. Mm -hmm. So I did a casting for the first time I've ever done a casting. It was really fun. And I emailed you a, a photo of it a couple of years ago, I think it was. I think so. Yeah. And you said, yeah, that's interesting. We talk. We're here. Right. So talk and tell me your, tell me what you opinion. Well, of. once again, I, uh, like you, uh, eyes is uh, almost instantly drawn to what at first glance, looks a lot like a boot heel. You would think maybe uh, waders or something like that. And um, but there is this uh, aspect that is rather familiar to me because, as it turns out, I, I happen to have a, a cast right on display when you brought this that bears a remarkable resemblance. I mean, uncanny resemblance. It's very similar in size and proportion and the configuration. Uh, what superficially looks like a boot heel actually has a very rounded contour. It has a very irregular shape here, uh, which converged very uh, closely with the appearance of this this other example that, that uh, we came to compare and contrast with. Um, I suspect that this feature is actually uh, what we call a mid-tarsal pressure ridge. One of the distinguishing characteristics of the Sasquatch foot is a retention of a much greater degree of mobility through what is the instep of our foot. Um, the, that arched uh, configuration of the human foot that, that actually twists into a very stable uh, uh, relationship so the foot can act as a very efficient lever in propulsing us, okay. us forward. The primitive condition is a very flexible foot that's more adapted to climbing in the very irregular substrate of a, of a forest canopy. To be able to grasp a substrate, a support like a limb or a branch, and yet still be able, able to lever okay. Okay. The, the mass upward um, requires a certain degree of flexibility between the forefoot and the hind foot. So when that's translated to the ground or transposed to the ground, the heel comes up flexing across that instep, and pressure is concentrated through the forefoot. Sometimes, as in the case of this muddy soil, uh, the soil yields under that pressure. Since there's not a heel to compact it, it humps up like a little speed bump. And sometimes it gets actually pushed back so that it humps up and it may slide, may fracture. Okay. And that gives the artificial appearance of this boot heel edge, okay. but, but would account for the irregularities you see, because it's not always a real sharp edge, it can be, you know, kind of uh, disjunct. And in fact, the example that we had look, sitting side by side looked remarkably similar in that configuration. So then that takes us up to the front, and, and as you pointed out in our initial conversations, instead of a nice rounded contour of a, of a you know, a well-formed boot, we have some irregular indentations and some which bear uncanny resemblance to toes. And, uh, and indeed, the size, the shape, proportion is remarkably similar to this one particular cast that, uh, that uh, we kind of gravitated to from uh, 
the uh, Mill Creek drainage area. Oh, okay. Of, uh, I was wondering where that came from. The Blue Mountains of southeastern Washington. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's one that was cast by Paul Freeman, one of, of uh, literally dozens that uh, wow. that he cast in that region over a, over a span of 10, 15 years. So, um, you know, there's always, the context is always critical. Yeah. And, and your initial descriptions betray a certain re reticence in the fact that this is an area that's frequented by, by recreationists and so forth, fishermen and whatnot. And so an isolated footprint, you know, I, I always caution people that when dealing with an isolated footprint, um, you're, you have to be careful not to overinterpret. Sure. If you can establish a pattern, if right. there are others, then you have greater confidence that the features you're looking at are not singular artifacts, but are actually real features that are find repetition in succession. Now, when I found this, right off the river, there's a little beaver creek, and there's mud and such. This was in some really deep grass, mm -hmm. and there were other footprints in there. Mm -hmm. But when I looked at the water shoe footprints, it was obviously splayed like a person right. with bad, bad foot <laughs> or can't walk very well. Um, but they were distinctly different than this. They were narrower. Yes, that's another. They, yeah, they were narrower and they were dis you, very distinct. There was no toe looking thing. And what right. struck me about this was it was only in the grass. Uh -huh. Yeah. As yeah, if most people would avoid would avoid the grass. I mean, it was it was it was nasty. Avoid the mud, yeah. And it was <laughs> only in the grass. And my the reason I found this is curious is we found some other curious oddities in the same area within 150 feet. We found a very curious tree breakage manipulation that makes me think that yeah, there's something else going on there. And to have this at the same time, it was like. That's why I cast it. Right. Because it was, it, was, it was curious. Yeah, yeah. Um, the width of this mm -hmm. is something else that struck me. Right. And that is one of the distinguishing features of, of uh, Sasquatch tracks, the, the breadth to length ratios of the foot, both the forefoot and especially the heel, uh, are quite discriminating. Uh, if, you, if you take metrics of, of heel breadth to length, and plot it against four foot to length, you get a bivariate plot that is is quite distinctive from human values. It's mm -hmm. offset. So for a given length, um, the breadths are, are very significantly different, uh, greater. You know, a heel, if this were a barefoot, you know, the heel would be literally you know, two thirds of that width, right. probably for a foot that this that is this length. And uh, even with a a boot, uh, most, you know, if you think about most waders and whatnot that do in fact have a heel attached, mm -hmm. and if they even do, um, they, they tend to be quite tapered. They don't make a big broad... Uh, Which I absolutely uh, did yeah. not see wader prints anywhere else in this area. Yeah. So, you know, I, I would have to say that, that there are limitations to the inferences that can be drawn from a single footprint under those circumstances. And yet, there's nothing that immediately betrays this as an obvious human uh, barefoot or shod foot print. Especially and what that, I thought, what I interpreted yeah, as, as a exactly. toe. Exactly. Yeah. That, <laughs> that that's what yeah. that's what and pushed I was, me over the edge to catch that. And I was uh, very impressed. I mean, like I said, when <laughs> you, you look at this in isolation is one thing, but then when you take this other cast, which has a much more extensive provenience. I mean, it clearly was part of a long trackway. Very confident in mm -hmm. its footprint. And then to put it up side by side and see the remarkable convergence between a well-established uh, example and this, that really reinforces the possibility, the very real possibility, that indeed, yes, this is a, a, a bona fide uh, Sasquatch footprint. I mean, we, we would certainly benefit and would certainly want to see more sure. uh, and under I, ideal circumstances. But. What's interesting is, is we have so many stories in the immediate area 
Yes. Mm-hmm. Of there's fishing ponds there and people having rocks thrown at them from the thickets mm-hmm. in, at, while they're fishing right. and landing in the pond. Right, right. Things like that, that, I mean, we're talking within a couple hundred yards of this location. Right. Um, and again, our weird trees that we found. Yeah. I laughed at this three years ago. Yeah. Thinking that we live in the high desert of Colorado. Yeah. Yeah. 10 miles away from the nearest mountain. Right. Yet these river bottoms oh, seem sure. to be. Oh, they're, they're rich. Uh, yeah, they're rich. And, and it's interesting in, uh, in that this kind of ecology, the biodiversity found along the, the, the riparian uh, habitat, as it's referred, along these streams and rivulets and, and springs is tremendous. They, they are oases and the, mm-hmm. and the wildlife are attracted to them for those resources and it allows them to occupy areas that would otherwise be rather inhospitable. So, so yeah, you know, when we discuss sas- potential Sasquatch habitat, you know, we tend to gravitate to a description of what we would call the primary, the, the prime habitat. Mm-hmm. But all species have uh, marginal, they have secondary habitat and so forth where uh, where they're they're constantly kind of pushing the edge of the envelope as sure. for, for their distribution and uh, and there are resources there to be had so they may not spend all of their time there but right. they may, but uh, in this case a water source all the plant life and uh, the animals that th- that attracts is also attractive to a, a higher predator or a consumer. And uh, well, this is this has been amazing. Thank you yeah. for taking the time, well, Matthias. Did you have? Any yeah, questions? I don't mind if there are a couple of questions. Well, sure. Uh, for me, like it's always interesting, like to see like the, the foot shape and its functionality. Mm-hmm. And uh, can you kind of go over like some of the differences? You know, because a human foot, right, like is is able to propel itself more long distance. I would assume. Yes. Right, because it can get rigid. Sure. Versus this is more adaptable over rough terrain. Can you right. give like kind of a comparison between right. like capabilities right. between that? And Certainly. That? Well, the human adaptation, which is actually a fairly recent innovation, uh, there's evidence of, of well, the, the arch didn't just uh, emerge wholesale, uh, you know, whole cloth rather, but rather uh, there are sort of incremental changes to the foot, including the loss of the divergence of the big toe and then greater stability of the outer, what we call the, the lateral column of the foot through the heel and the, and the cuboid, the bone immediately in front of the heel bone. Um, which is part of that former flexibility. And then only very recently did the medial arch really take its shape and and we lost a lot of the range of motion between the ankle bone and the, the bone immediately uh, distal to it, the, the navicular, um, which used to provide a great deal of flexion and extension and even, even rotation. And now that our, that joint surface is greatly restricted, so there's there's very little movement. And those bones, as they twist during the latter part of the stance phase, lock into a fixed position, what we call a closed pack position, where the joint surfaces are most congruent and stable. And that's when the entire body mass is being transmitted through the foot, usually one foot at that point, mm-hmm. uh, one foot and uh, through the ball uh, mm-hmm. of the foot. And so the arch provides a stable platform that allows much more efficient, efficient leverage. And, and yes, we've kind of become, you know, what I described, lean, mean, walking and running machines. We've, th- this emergence, this refinement of the, of the arched foot coincides also with the tremendous reduction in the robusticity of the skeleton and musculature so that we've really lightened down. So mm. we've gone from the NFL linebacker motif to a, a marathon runner, you know, and you just, just within our own species comparing those two physiques, yeah. uh, you can see some of the contrast and then it's kind of like the, the birds of our, of, of our genus or of other primates and stuff. Right. Right, hollow bones. <laughs> right, right, yeah, exactly. And so that that reduction has has um, uh, uh, emphasized our ability to um, uh, traverse much greater distances and so forth. Uh, we you, you look at hunter gatherer societies, and uh, when they go out foraging, they will cover 
you know, sometimes 10 or 11 miles a day in their, in their routine, mm. compared to say a chimpanzee band, even in secondary habitat where their resources are more dispersed, you know, they may go a couple miles in a day. Mm. So the, the demands on the, on the musculoskeletal system as it relates to, to locomotive so to moving about is kind of different. Different. So kind of one of our superpowers in the right type of terrain. Of course, yeah. Because we go to mountain terrain and it's a little tricky to go exactly. over those rocks. Like exactly. Under terrain, like you can feel it like in your in your ankles and in your foot as you're right. traverse. Yeah, yeah. We're the, the these refinements have largely emerged in the lowland on the flat, mm -hmm. and uh, whereas Sasquatch, I think the reason they have, although they've lost the divergent big toe because they're no longer arboreal. You know, mm -hmm. when you're an 800 pound gorilla, it <laughs> doesn't make much sense. Plus, you know, uh, uh, safety wise, to go up into the canopy. Uh, although, some, you know, it, it was actually a surprising revelation that some mature gorillas do brave climbing up in mm. to get particular resources and go really high up into the canopy at times. But they haven't much business being up there because <laughs> a fall, you know, can be fatal. Mm -hmm. And, um, Plus the fact that in temperate forests, coniferous forests particularly, there aren't the resources up there to attract. The carbohydrates and sugars are in the understory and the subterranean mm -hmm. um, uh, area. So the shrubs are the fruit bearing plants. Mm -hmm. um, you know, pine cones aren't so attractive. Now in some cases, sugar cones, uh, uh, bears really go after those, but they let squirrels do the harvesting mm -hmm. and cache the pine nuts. Oh, okay. And the, the squirrels actually have uh, faux caches to distract the bears from their <laughs> principal <laughs> caches. And so they actually provision the bears to satisfy them. It's kind of like paying off the yeah. mafia. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. But, uh, so, and so a Sasquatch has, you know, a 700 pound, Sasquatch has no, no cause. Uh, I'm sure they use the trees, especially in, in youth and infancy, to, to seek uh, uh, refuge and so forth, resort there. But, but then you point out also, in rough, irregular terrain, the advantage of this um, uh, model or this uh, architecture, retaining the flexibility of the midfoot and push off from the entire forefoot rather than concentrating at the ball of the foot and through the toes, spares the toes, the bending stresses that we impose on our foot, which have selected for shortening of the toes mm -hmm. compared to chimps and gorillas. Interesting. Um, so with that bending stress avoided, the Sasquatch has retained longer toes, not as long as as a gorilla or chimp, but very similar to early bipedal hominins, mm. with which also had flexible insteps. You know, this was this was one of the drum beats I pounded for ten years yeah. before it finally started to stick with my colleagues. That's that, something that's normal that seen yeah. within the fossil record as right. an adaptation. Absolutely, okay. early bipedal hominins walked on flat, flexible feet for several millions of years. So we're kind of like the novelty. In yeah, our foot it's a recent emergence. It's not something that's in that, that appeared in lockstep with the mm -hmm. advent of bipedalism. So that's what's expected. Yes, exactly. Cool. And so that uh, and that's a, a, a great advantage. Those longer toes to um, to negotiate to to gain purchase of grip on irregular surfaces, rocky slopes, you know, steep. Steep inclines with lots of deadfall and so forth, but also you know if you've ever hiked off trail, most hiking trails you know take advantage of the principle of the switchback and have a certain grade, uh, and you can essentially walk ambulate normally on those. But if you go off trail and try to go up a steep slope, you you kind of you have to act sort of like the mountaineer with the with the crampons going up the glacier. You stick your toes in because your foot's rigid. It can't, and your ankle uh, doesn't um, have that much. Doesn't have the range of motion. But you know, if uh, I we have no data on the range of motion of the Sasquatch ankle, but I would suggest that it, it we will find that it is comparable to a chimpanzee and so forth. And so when they go up, they can incline their foot 
and the foot can accommodate with that midfoot flexibility to that steeper angle, still having the prehensile capability of those longer toes. So, but, so you'll be finding a pad, kind of like a bear's, correct me if I'm wrong, almost like a pad right. of a bear's pad That's right. on, a, on a steep if, incline. If their heel doesn't make contact, in other words, if they're going up steep, with, it would be, if the foot would flex through the transverse tarsal joint and you would have just the forefoot, exactly. But it would be more extensive in, in uh, coverage in the, the area than, say, the abbreviated footprint that you leave when you sprint down the beach on the balls of your feet, right. and it looks like a little five-toed dog track kind of, you know, right. just very abbreviated, basically just the heads of the metatarsals, the, the bones in the instep of the foot are touching down. But since they don't have an arch to support that posture, the foot collapses into flexion across the transverse tarsal joint. You get an entire, what I call, a half track. That's half track. that's interesting because in this immediate area, I found some of those. Oh, okay. That's, but I, I in a press, it, the gradient was probably forty-five degrees. Okay. And I found that when <clears throat> it's a big imprint, by that, well, oh, maybe it's a elk or yes. something, you know, because yes. it, there was no distinct toes. Ah, I see. But it was this big something pressed in. Right. Yay big. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I went I, right next to right next to one of my hurricane trees. Yeah. And I documented on video, but yeah. I didn't I couldn't I didn't have anything to place it with. So yeah. that's yeah. that's curious. I'm not making any claims, but it is I did find it. That's and, and that's a very telling uh feature. I, I first stumbled on this notion when uh I was examining a set of photographs that were taken by Don Abbott, who was the cultural anthropologist at the University of British Columbia Museum. And he had gone down at the behest of John Green and Bob Titmus, or let's see, John Green and Rene de Hinton, I think it was at that time, um, to examine the footprints that were found immediately before the, the patterson Gimlin film mm -hmm, shot mm -hmm. there at Blood Creek. And here was a series of, of shots, you know, and, and uh, these were full-length tracks, and then here's one, and it's just half a track. And I'm going, what? And when I outlined, I found that the half track uh, terminated right where the transverse tarsal <laughs> toys. What, a, what yeah. an exciting so in other words, Yeah. I mean, if you look at uh, that famous uh, Titmus track that I've drawn attention to mm -hmm. much greater, and where, where you've got the speed bump and then the heels behind it, if you just ignore everything proximal to the speed bump, what you see is what a half track would look like. Well, so, I will compare that to what, like I said, I've got yeah. video evidence oh, yeah, yeah, of yeah. what I found. That I just didn't include it because yeah. I could, didn't know what it was. Sure, that would be interesting. To... Um, you had mentioned weight. Yeah. This is obviously not a particularly large track. No. I mean, this, and it's no. pressed in the mud. I know I was walking in the mud. I was pressing down in there. What's, I know it's almost impossible to gauge, but suspicion-wise of something of this size, what kind of weight would we be looking at, do you think? Well, right, and and, and it would just be kind of a, an extrapolation sure. from the estimates that we've made on others. I'm, I'm pretty confident in the estimates for Patty because we have that view of her from various perspectives. We have a little bit of sense of, you know, of the kind of barrel shape of her torso and the massiveness of her appendages and using a model based on on a body constructed of a series of cylinders mm -hmm. just to get a ballpark we, we have a good idea of what composite tissue of organisms uh, what the density is and ergo the weight uh, and so finding her mass I'm sorry finding her volume allows us to determine her mass sure. And she comes out about, if, if she is in the range of about six foot eight, somewhere between six and a half to seven feet, uh, she comes out right around 700 pounds. Okay. 700 pounds. <laughs> so an animal with a foot like this, which is probably on the order, you know, here without a scale in front of me, I would guess about 13 inches, 12 to 13 inches. Uh, still, I would put, if you know, given the breadth, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, a creature like this would probably be at least... 300, 400 pounds. Interesting. You know, at least. And that's well, that gives me something, apart. because of where we're at and where we're poking around in here, that helps me get a sense of what is going on. Right. These trees that I found uh -huh. Uh -huh. easily support my weight at 
200 pounds. Uh-huh. I could see them holding three to 400 pounds. Mm-hmm. Beyond that, that's one of Mateo's biggest arguments was like, how can this hold yeah. something that weighs 1,000 pounds? It's yeah. like, I, it yeah. can't. Yeah. But what I'm finding certainly could hold, Right. I would suspect, three oh, yeah. to 400 pounds. Yeah. And obviously, it's not a linear relationship right. because, you know, the volume increases isometrically right. or allometrically, not isometrically. It uh, increases to the cube of linear dimensions. So as you get you know bigger by an inch right. in length and breadth, that means that the uh, the mass is three times that increase. Yeah. This has been super interesting because it's really helping build some pictures. Yeah. Of the weirdness that we're finding, uh-huh. <laughs> you know, and, and fill in some gaps and say, okay, well, you know. So you know how like everyone's always talking about how like oh they can just disappear so fast, it's superhuman, all this stuff, and that leads to all these different like inductive reasoning of oh well they, they're jumping in and out of portals, right? right? Right. But I propose based on like what I understand about primate, you know, like uh, like the way their brains work through tests, like chimpanzees for example, right? They can think. 10 times faster than us and can have a short-term memory 10 times faster than we do. Mm-hmm. So imagine having like a, a, a mind built for, I, I like to call it the procedural world, right? Mm-hmm. Built to be able to, to adapt really quickly in the moment. So imagine having a strength of something like a Sasquatch and being able to think 10 times faster than us and be able to execute moves that would mm-hmm. normally take us, you know, like walking really difficultly through, through like woods not to try to be quiet and stealthy. They could be able to execute immediately compared oh, sure. to us. And so by our perspective, yeah, it does look superhuman because it is. Right. For well, us. it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. By, by our standards, yeah. And, and all you have to do is is reflect on the history of some of the field studies of other great apes, like, you know, uh, attempts to film chimpanzees that have not been habituated to human interaction. And it's like they just melt into the foliage. I mean, the, here, here, and you're not talking about just a single, but a, a band of raucous potentially loud and, and, and noisy and uh, 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 apes, and yet they can be absolutely silent, they can just slip into the foliage, they can just disappear. I mean, even the, I've seen the, you know, the films and everyone has where the traffic has stopped as the silverback is escorting his troop across, and they just almost m- magically appear from the foliage, <laughs> cross the road, and then they just disappear, and boom, they're gone. I mean, these gigantic animals are just gone. I've experienced it with um, elk. We were up in the Olympic Peninsula one time, and there was a sizable uh, group of elk, not a full herd, but I mean, these are massive animals, and with racks, mm-hmm. and um, they go, whoosh, disappear into the, into the trees, and you look for signs. First of all, it was difficult to find even hoof prints. Yeah. yeah. And second of all, you know, they're, they, they've adapted, so they lay their head back in these big racks, are then inclined and they just go through and just part the, the, the trees, but it doesn't shred them. It's yeah, not like it's so you, know, you look down and here's this tunnel of battered and right. And kind of goes against our expectations. Yeah, yeah. and these are big thousand pound creatures, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and a cluster of them, a dozen or more at a time, and they move through the forest as quickly and silently and, and uh, with leaving. Uh, Isn't that what they call them, the ghosts of the forest? They could. They, they I think, apply I think, to a lot of I think different... That's what, uh, P, what PD, I think, means or something like that. A, lot of, a, a lot of different uh, that's different crazy. animals that's applied to. So it's um, it's not surprising. I mean, it, it, it all it does is betray our, uh, our, our most people's general lack of comprehension mm-hmm. and appreciation of nature. Totally. You know, we've Something lost track of those. We're pretty complacent points. up in the woods. Something we've noticed and have kind of documented at least twice now where a sighting or where a, a sighting position where they go to to watch, the foliage has been manipulated oh, to allow yeah. them to ingre- ingress and egress quietly mm. and quickly. Mm-hmm. But they've bent they've bent branches, mm. broken them off so that this one specific one, there was a... Uh, but it's also based off of ancestral evidence, why we even look in the, that right. in the first place. So this, 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 right. this one witness said he was barbecuing, there was a tree, he saw shoulders on either side. So I went behind the trunk, came towards it, and all the branches were pointing towards, or you're the trunk, all the branches are pointing this way, but all the branches pointing this way were broken out. So I could 
work uh, my way up to yeah. you, but if I got spotted, I could come this way without disturbing branches. Yes, yeah, getting snagged on. And we've noticed that twice That's now. True. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So it's not just simply that we move well, right? but we actually manipulate yeah. our environment so that we can spy. Sure. That's true. So one last one last uh, question for me. Uh, so I so for a long time I assumed like maybe bipedalism wasn't an effective evolution, you know, like because we we don't have we only have us as that. But then when I started learning about like chimpanzees and those huge troops mm -hmm. that now they go hunting, mm -hmm. they stand like they, like from what I read like they'll stand up as they hunt because they can see further away. Sure, oh, yeah. and that made me realize that kind of creates like. A, 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 like a incentive to stand yeah. when you as a predator and so then we have all these fossil records of bipedalism going on but do you think it was incentivized like bipedalism for hunting or do you think maybe other other types of well I think it's a combination of quite a number if you, if you look at the literature and there's, and there's been a lot of discussion <laughs> and debate about what were the motivating factors for the evolution of bipedalism and uh, and I was I came up through a, uh, a tradition uh, uh, my mentors uh, emphasized, not to exclusivity, but they emphasized the mechanical aspects of it. So you have the things, the, the, uh, the just so stories about you know, carrying stuff, provisioning people or individuals back at, their, uh, at the camp. You have standing up to get the view. Mm -hmm. You have standing up to have less surface area exposed to the sun. And but one is when you your uh, thorax and shoulder girdle has been modified for uh, arm movements like this that are involved in vertical climbing and, and overhead reaching and hanging, our our thorax is flattened and our shoulder blades are on the backs of our thorax mm -hmm. and so when we adopt a quadrupedal posture, or if, if a suspensory adapted primate adapts a, adopts a quadrupedal posture like a gorilla or a chin. Um, they're actually placing the shoulder joint into shear because all committed quadrupeds have deep narrow rib cages, mm -hmm. shoulder blades on the side, so now they're aligned with the shoulder and so the, the joint is experiencing compressive forces. Um, joints tolerate compressive forces quite readily, but shear forces, the tendency to push one bone past the other, that's not good. And so if those um, shear forces are amplified by excessive mass, when a big ape is committed to the ground, it has two choices. Well, it has three choices. One is to walk quadrupedally in a palmograde fashion. Um, one is to walk bipedally. The third I added is, you know, because we see a different solution in chimps and gorillas because of their disproportionate um, limb um, lengths, mm -hmm. then their forearms or, or forelimbs are so exaggerated now because they're so adapted to quadruped yeah. uh, to, to by, uh, hanging suspensory that when they're on the ground, that it naturally pushes their body back reduces the stress on the shoulders and emphasizes the uh, compressive forces on the hips. Which creates mm. a different form of movement. Exactly. Oh. So we, oh. it's a modified quadrupedalism, i.e. knuckle walking. And yeah. they walk on their knuckles because they have these very mobile wrists from hanging and swinging. And so when, you know, even, even people, I'm one, you know, if yeah. I do push-ups like this, it really hurts through my wrist. Mm -hmm. So. You know, people have designed gadgets to yeah. do push-ups on. That's the reason yeah, for that. Or just oh, just turn your your uh, hand, you know, from this posture to this posture, mm -hmm. so that this is compression now. Yeah. And you know, the, these bones are pretty stable. The mm -hmm. metacarpals it's all lined up. Yeah, you can line up, or you can even do a gorilla stance. It's just the problem is we haven't evolved the even lengths, the yeah. subequal oh. lengths. See, so it puts everything on the middle one. If you look at the gorilla, these are almost all the same length, so it's much more. And their fingers are webbed up higher, so it gives greater stability. Oh, the webs are up there. Yeah, so it, like, that yeah. Is so interesting. Anyway, so so wow. that, that so knuckle walking is a very modified. So if we can acknowledge that, set it aside for a minute, then we're left with these two possibilities: mm -hmm. you either walk on all fours, or you walk on 
on uh, twos. Well, walking on twos is a pretty likely solution to avoid in a big ache to avoid these compressive forces through their shoulders and their elbows and their wrists and and uh, and finger bones and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that that's one explanation, yeah. uh, mechanical. But see, if you combine that with the fact that yeah, once you do that, there's all kinds of other benefits, like being able to see farther or freeing your hands to carry yeah. things, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's hard to know which one was the. the well, thing. yeah, and and, it, and and why should we separate them? I mean, I think mm -hmm. the fact that there's sure. the synergism and there's mutual reinforcement mm -hmm. of all of these selection pressures would just strengthen. The likelihood of the outcome, the common outcome to all those yeah. those uh, um, pressures or selection selection pressures, both positive and negative, and and so um, the idea that bipedalism was an exclusive, isolated event, just a one. I mean, it's kind of like the origin of life. We always yeah. get fall in this trap that it happened just once. Mm -hmm. You know, there was this serendipitous. There's a cartoon I show my students. Where it shows this little tepid pond in a in an ancient earth, and it says two amino acids drifting towards each other, <laughs> and then it's and this is like four point seven billion years ago, and then it says um, uh, four point four you know four point seven one billion or it says, yeah. two, two seconds later it says two <laughs> seconds later two amino acids drifting apart, and then it goes. 3.2 billion years ago. <laughs> so in other words, it only happened once and it only happened, it was this singular rare event. Mm -hmm. And now, that's old school. Yeah. Now, I mean, there were there were things going on in little tepid ponds under the ice, you know, in, in uh, fumeral vents at the bottom of the ocean. I mean, life, it, it was uh, a uh, obligatory outcome of, of matter. With, with ups and downs. Down. Exactly. Same with, with, I think, with bipedalism. You know, you get all these organisms that are right on the verge anatomically and behaviorally. Uh, why should we think that it only happened once? Well, and that, yeah. now there's evidence. Yeah, that, the fossil record. Exactly. That Everywhere. <laughs> that there were multiple origins and even some Miocene apes that, that went extinct, like uh, Oreopithecus, mm -hmm. that may have been largely bipedal when it when it was on the ground, but it, otherwise it was climbing around in the in the uh, canopy of these flooded forests. And, and that's only a small piece that we can see in the fossil record, because oh, right. we can only get little glimpses yeah. of what was out there yeah. through the fossil record. And also, kind of like your discussion yesterday, one of the big ones is learning about like decomposition, how fast things decompose, yeah. or even like the, like in chimpanzees, right? They only have one, I think, fossil of, of a... Yeah, like, just, just three or four teeth of one individual, basically. Yeah, but yeah. we know they've been around for millions of years. Seven million years at least, yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> they're still around today. Yeah. And also the, the proportion of bears to Sasquatch, that, yeah. that's amazing, because that's the big question. Why don't we find bones? It's like, well, we don't find bones of bears that's very right. often at all. That's right. If this is one out of every 40, <laughs> or something like that, I right. think is what you were saying. Uh, yeah, one one Sasquatch to every one hundred to two hundred. Two hundred, right? So and that's just a ballpark, right. you know, just a just a rule of thumb. Yeah, that's so even that's assuming you cool. come across one and, I, and can identify it, right? Like a piece of one, instead of just being like, "That's an elk bone," because I know, like, I'd most likely be like, "That's most likely like a just a, a big elk bone or something." Right. Sure, uh, I'd be dismissive. Right. Yeah. So they probably they, they probably have been come across, but if they don't have like any knowledge right to be able to identify the anatomy of the structure yeah. unless because they're not going to find the whole skeleton they're most likely yeah. going to find a piece yeah. of it they're not yeah. going to know any better so that yeah that reduces the the, the chances even down. more yeah if, if you don't find a diagnostic characteristic unless it's a cranium mm -hmm. most people are not going to have the wherewithal mm -hmm. and even then i mean i i totally. was uh, i was all excited because a fellow contacted me and he was on a construction crew putting in a power line a big power line through Southern Oregon through the Rogue River country, real wild back country. And he said, well, he stayed way back. And he says, I, I've had a human osteology class in college, so I know what I'm talking about. He said, I, I found what you're looking for. I said, well, send me a photo as soon yeah. as you can. So eventually he sent me a photo. It was a moose skull with the snout broken off right here to make it. So, oh. But I mean, I mean, it, it didn't resemble anything like a primate whatsoever. Interesting. So, I was so hopeful, and it just you know, so now I know. And, 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 and it's another lesson too: is you cannot rely on eyewitness anecdotes without mm -hmm. substantiation and documentation. Hundred percent. You just can't. I mean, you can you can throw it in the hopper and see if there are some patterns that might emerge, but 
but uh, it's it's very very problematic, you know. So the criticisms about the reliability of eyewitness testimony, and there's been some more positive. We just published an article, or no, we didn't publish it. it was I reviewed it and commented on it. It was actually published in the, in a different journal, Anomalistic, and uh, was the name of the journal. But but it was about it was a, a kind of a rethink about the utility of uh, of eyewitness testimony. No. And my comment was, while I was very pleased to see this this uh, uh, reassessment of the value, because there is value, mm -hmm. but you still have to have this cautionary note because, you know, focusing on footprints, I've had ample experience where people have asserted things to me. Sure. And yet when I, when I say, okay, but where's the documentation? Oh, okay. And they bring out the footprint or the photograph and it's nothing. Right. You know, then even in that case, you can document, in the case of the eyewitness accounts, you know, you're left entirely to their uh, interpretation the interpretation of their experience, yeah. yeah. We, so it's, it's a dodgy, you know, it's always... What we found is the eyewitness accounts, what that's helped us do it's is, like a lead. is a lead to narrow down. Right, narrow right. Search. So what, what, when, I, when I get one weird story, that's a weird story. When you get two stories, that's, when it starts to establish a pattern like this one canyon, we've had multiple encounters from that. People telling us stories from there. Yeah. Does it mean anything? No. But at least there's multiple people telling us something. So it gives us a place to look, to investigate. And that's what led us to here. Right. You know, we started one place, and that we found some other oddities. And then I continued searching along the river, found the, found the trees, then we found this. Yeah. And... Uh, now, now I know to do to look at those other prints because right, yeah. that was interesting because that was going straight up a hill, and the spacing from the first one to the second one, which the reason I thought it was just erosion, I, I, but the spacing was about six and a half feet mm. of stride, yeah. and I actually said that's huge yeah. as I'm videoing it, but I didn't know. Right. Well, and the fact, and maybe just erosion. The fact that. That the stride is lengthened would also accord with the half tracks because those are mm -hmm. also not only are they in, um, found in situations where it's climbing and incline, but when they're running. Mm -hmm. See, so so um, we we have interesting examples. Uh, one of the very very clear examples that I have the Hereford track mm -hmm. also included half tracks. And when you looked at the scenario, it was milling about the equipment, like it was investigating what's going on here. And then it was probably spooked by something. I suspect it was actually the workers who discovered the tracks. Because then there's a straight beeline of, of half tracks with twice the step length. That Interesting. Oh. Heading straight back for the tree line. And so boom, 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 you know. And, and uh so it's not a casual walk, it's a, it's a oh, I'm no. getting out of here. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. Really interesting, because I was, I was reading about like just human anatomy and like how they were doing like a, you know, like just how people like run. Right. And they found out like in another study that it was doing, the first study that showed like the, uh, they run the, the ball of their foot. Right. But they found out that they only do that when, uh, not, not when they're running comfortably, when they're running comfortably, they go like midfoot. Right. But when they're, but when they're running like a, at a speed that they feel like not necessarily comfortable at, They'll run on the ball of their foot to improve, yeah. uh, you know, like the, that, so they can get the progression. Yeah, yeah. Bullshit. So I wonder if that's something <clears throat> similar. With, it could be. With this. It could be. I mean, we, you know, there's a whole um, debate know. about uh, uh, heel strike running versus toe to heel running. Mm -hmm. And um, when you look at uh, indigenous peoples, you know, they run who never worn shoes, they don't heel strike. When they're when they're running, and uh, even at a moderate pace, you know they're they're coming down on the toes because one it spares the that extreme yeah, compressive force on, on the heel, sure. but also it by doing that it loads the Achilles tendon, the calcaneal tendon, which is a great oh. elastic storage mechanism. Exactly. When you heel strike, it does just the opposite. See, mm -hmm. and so there's tremendous advantage. Our our anatomy is actually designed for that toe strike first because then it drives the heel downward, you know, and that lengthens, puts tension on the Achilles tendon, which stores some of that elastic uh, uh, kinetic energy, which can be returned 
um, at, at, a, at a significant economy. I mean, it's a, I can't remember the exact value, but it's like 20% of the kinetic energy is returned. You know, it's just like, you know, see the kangaroos, the big giant red kangaroos have taken this to the extreme and, uh, and are, are the, um, once they get up to a certain speed, and especially in the tail too, because they, they cantilever that stiff tail with the body out in front of these long legs. So not only are they storing the elastic energy in the, in the, in the uh, lower extremity, uh, but with each strike, the torso and tail flex and that tenses the, back up. Exactly, oh. tenses the ligaments. And so when they when they recoil, it literally helps to lift, you know, That's aids amazing. aids the propulsion. Well, so they get to a certain a point and, and their energy consumption just drops right off. It's just boom, boom, boom. They're just bouncing along, you know. What percentage would you Oh I don't know. It's not I mean it's but still it's higher than twenty, right? If we're, oh, if we're yeah. 20, oh yeah, definitely higher than twenty. Maybe about fifty yeah. percent or something. Yeah, so That's they insane. can yeah, something like that. But That's you know that's crazy. Crazy. Well, that's, that's interesting about those dog tracks that we found that oh, the heel yeah. strike, you know, it's a wolf that was yeah. running or something, right? And the, the, fat, the, fat, no, not the duke lock, lock, but the, the duke lock? No, the, uh, there's a little pad that's way front. back here. Oh, they're, yeah. They're yeah, front yeah. whole puck and like hyper extend. And then this was hitting. Oh, oh really? <laughs> yeah, we have. We video. had to go talk uh, to a veterinarian and stuff because you could see like the whole imprint, and we found that's actually normal in canines where the oh, whole like front, the whole thing is so flexible and it hyper extends out, oh, and, then, and, out, oh, and then and then helps them like in the same okay. way. But it just blew our mind because we yeah. never even thought that that was that the dog possible. Yeah, the dogs like could do that. They're they're anatomy. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. This has been this has been huge. Yep, absolutely, I really absolutely. appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Hey kid, don't ever let them get inside your head They'll tell you what to do in life instead Of everything you know that you could get Don't let them guide your life towards regret I'll fight for what I love with every breath My past is filled with things I won't forget I use them all to push me to my best So treat the worst of times just like a test if only I could go back in time I'd tell myself that everything will end up alright Just push yourself, test yourself, figure out what you like And find your limits, don't be rigid, always work towards a prime Surround yourself with open minds, people can change your life A few friends with intent can help you feel alive Find a passion, take some action, and with a little time Just be patient, make a statement, try to enjoy your life They'll try to kick you while you're down they wanna rise up while you drown They wanna fill your head with doubt They're silently scared that you'll figure it out I'll make it look like I'm losing Won't bother hiding my bruises And when they finally think you're wounded Then it's your chance to be ruthless